Hello and welcome to this webcast brought to you by CSO and Cloudflare. I'm Cathy O'Sullivan, the Editor-in-Chief in APAC for Foundry's flagship enterprise brands, CIO and CSO. Now, security leaders are bracing themselves as the relentless cycle of new phishing scams, malware attacks and AI-enabled threats make it hard to stay a step ahead. In today's environment, security leaders expect breaches to be a matter of when, not if. Against this background, the Department of Home Affairs is proposing to establish a cyber incident review board to protect and investigate Australian organizations that have been breached. But is this enough? So in this webcast held in collaboration with Cloudflare, we dissect real life cyber breaches for valuable insights into ways to safeguard your assets, data, reputation, and clients, and navigate the threat landscape with confidence. So joining us to discuss this and more, we have Ben Munro, the Senior Director, APJC for Cloudflare. Hello, Ben. Hi, Kathy. And we also have Matt O'Kane, who is the Director at Notion Digital Forensics. Welcome, Matt. Hello, Kathy. And now over to you, Ben. Great. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, it's great to be here. Looking forward to spending some time uh, talking about these uh, these topics. Um, cybersecurity is never far from the news headlines and never really far from what's important to all of us, which is to you know grow our businesses, keep our families and data safe, go on about our lives against a backdrop of, of uh, an ever you know, more dangerous threat landscape, if you like. Uh, just a real quick word on Cloudflare and why we're doing this, and, and I'll introduce Matt. And then Matt, as you said, has got some really great, compelling security stories to walk through and some really interesting thinking about um, the current regulatory landscape as it exists and, and as it might be. Um, Cloudflare, we're about, a, about 13 years old, uh, and we have been in the business of making the internet more secure for so for more than a decade now. Um, Cloudflare has built a massive global platform that actually helps to secure the internet, employees, devices, networks. And so we take security at scale uh, and, in fact, making the internet a safer place incredibly seriously. And that involves both the products that we build, which we give away for free and we sell to corporations. But it also means that having relationships with uh, government bodies, having relationships with communities of chief security officers and working with incredible partners like Matt, who are deeply embedded in solving some of those difficult problems we all face today, incredibly important to Cloudflare and really part of the reason we exist. So what we wanted to do is ask Matt to come on and really talk through his experience and shine a spotlight on his um, his work, uh, some case studies and some recommendations, and then take a couple of questions uh, at the end of it. So without further ado, Matt, you're a consummate storyteller and you have some great stories. So I'm just going to open the floor to you. And I think we'll go back and forth with a few questions and hopefully I can reflect what people are going to want to hear a little bit more of as, as you go through. So thanks for making time to be with us, Matt, and uh, let's uh, let's get into your stories. So thanks, Ben, for that introduction. So I just need to start with some formalities before we get started. And the formality is that I don't practice law, so none of what I put into today's presentation is advice, legal advice. You always got to seek legal advice. But what I do and what people like me do often interacts uh, with the potential justice system. So that, that's why we sort of touch upon it. I'm going to bring up a couple of cases today. They're real cases, but the facts have been altered or blended. And the reason that's done is because I want to pre protect client confidentiality. They use a permission on the condition that we don't try and unmask who these people are. So I ask that you respect the client's confidentiality. We've mixed up the details, but they're real cases. This is general advice. If you need specific advice, you need to just talk to someone like me. And I'm going to talk about some future proposed law. We never know how the political system is going to go, and we don't know what's going to change, but I think we've got reasonable guesses about the direction that it's going to go, and I'll argue my case during this presentation. Um, so I want to sort of cover um, one of the things I've learned 
from doing presentations is I've learned from one of the world's greatest video presenters, and that's Mr. Beast. And Mr. Beast has talked about how he puts together presentations, and he says, you always start with the most important things first. So I'm going to start with the walkaways first, and, and then we sort of build upon it. So there's not going to be any mystery about what's going to be in today's presentation. So the two walkaways from today is a society has higher expectations for how we prevent breaches and how we respond to breaches. We're no longer seen as a random senseless act. They're seen as something that we can do things to prevent. And they're seen as something that we can do things to mitigate after the breach. And one of the things, you can do many things to do both of those things. But one of the things you can do is to give yourself more control over your network. And so we're going to sort of explore that theme with a couple of case studies today and see how more control could potentially improve the outcomes. Um, well, I mean, like a, a very, very um, brief about me, you know, I run a digital forensics business and that's going to be about uh, insider threat investigations and responding to cyber emergencies, what we often call cyber incidents. But we spend about 20% of our time packaging up what we learn from cases and we share it with universities. And we try and do that because, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, this, this, these, these crimes are terrible. And the amount of suffering that people go through is horrible. And what we want to do is try and train the next batch of defenders in a way that helps prevent it. So here's a photo of me. Um, I'm, I'm at University of uh, New South Wales, Canberra branch, and you can see that I'm smiling here. That means that I'm enjoying being in Canberra, which is which is a normal state of affairs. And um, we're, 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 te we're teaching cyber national defenders how to actually prevent problems. We're trying to leverage the, the information we get from cases. Um, I just want to sort of dive in before we go any further. I want to sort of cover what it is that we do because it's a little bit uh, mysterious unless you've engaged someone like us. So what is digital forensics and incident response? There's, there's two main processes. I'll put them up on the screen now. And these processes are from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is the Department of the United States Commerce Department. And the, the, the two procedures are divided up into, into two standards. There's one that, that focuses on emergency response which is 80061, and there's one that focuses on investigations, which is 80086. And, and what's important about this is that many of you have some highly talented people in your organisations. And, you know, especially a larger organisation, you're going to have more opportunity to get access to great managed service providers, or you're going to have a great IT internal department. And these people would probably be pretty good at responding to a breach or you know you know they've, they've, they've read you know they've probably done some courses online what you're getting with us is that we've done it we do it all day this is what we do all day so instead of having to learn on the job when time is critical and time is critical in an emergency you, you can leverage our expertise and we run operations where um, you know we're advising the team we're saying you know this is step one this is step two and then we do things which are difficult for them to do so that might be large-scale forensics so we might have to look through hundreds or thousands of machines very quickly so that's hard for them to do right up to we'll run the whole process so we try and work constructively with our with our various uh, IT partners so why is this important it's important for two reasons the first reason is that we could, we see an increase in breaches. Now it's remarkably difficult to get reliable breach information um, because you know a lot of people don't want to report it. But one of the things they're happy to report it to is the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And what we've found in their latest reporting set is that if we have an organization of about 200 people, then the chance of that organization detecting a breach is one in two. And once that organisation numbers start to climb, that's no longer a chance of a breach each year. We're talking about the number of breaches each year. And the other thing to think about that number is that's a floor number. And the reason that's a floor number is because we're talking about what people detect, not what they 
um, you know, we, we they obviously can't report something they haven't detected, right? And there's a lot of breaches out there that haven't been detected. So it's it, it's not is you know we we in the past we thought of this as like a lightning strike or a rare unfortunate event, but but the reality is it's very common. So we should plan for it. That's part of the equation. But the other part of the equation is we see an epidemic of white collar crime. So today I've got a couple of new cases uh, where we have you know formally trusted employees who have done something to sort of undermine that trust. So we we might be asked to, asked a question like, did did the head of sales take the customer list and then, and then sell it? Uh, is the head of finance colluding with some of our opposition to share information about what we're paying suppliers? So we're asked these kind of questions all the time. So and, and these are not really, at least in Australia and New Zealand, these are not really police questions. These are more civil questions. So we have to have. We have to have some sort of mechanism to investigate and resolve these kind of questions. Um, but I guess the point of all this is, and what I want to get across today, is that we have this increase in society's expectations. And it's driven by two things. It's driven by an increase um, of people who are litigating about stuff that they think that was underdone in terms of breach defence or breach response. And we have this increase, and we have politicians paying attention to public sentiment, and politicians are putting their hand up and say, we can do more here. And one of the suggestions that they have is to replicate a concept that we see uh, in the air, in the air sort of um, uh, aircraft uh, industry. And that concept is, if there's an accident, we objectively review it, and we try and learn from it and we share that information publicly so everyone gets better. And now we have this very robust air uh, industry that's across the world. And to illustrate how that could possibly work, I want to uh, ask your permission to share a personal story. So this is a personal story uh, that really that I was involved with 20 years ago. And it's a bit serious, so hopefully we can uh, be a bit respectful of that. Um, but I want to sort of step through this personal story of mine and use that to illustrate how a potential cyber incident review board could work. And what I want to talk about is an accident at an airfield in Luskatire uh, Lusk Airfield, which is near Newcastle, New South Wales. So when I was younger, uh, I was involved with a group called Canteen, the Australian Teenage Patient Cancer Society. And is this something like it, Teenage Cancer Patient Society, and um, and one of the things that we had in the nineties, it was pretty, it was it was uh, it was a different time for teenagers with cancer. It was, you know, there's never a good time in history for a teenager to have cancer, um, but in the eighties and nineties, it was it was very tough. The technology was still evolving, um, you know, um, the medical uh, sector was still learning, and. One of the things that we had was we had these wonderful volunteers that would help us run weekends where we could take our members away and give them something unique and, and interesting uh, as an experience. And one of those weekends, we went to an airport, airfield uh, near Maitland. And we had this wonderful group of volunteers who had these World War I Tiger Moth planes. And each, we did this a couple of times, that we get a patient in the back of the of the, um, the plane, and they do loop de loops and they do barrel rolls, and it was unreal. And at the end of the weekend, um, they'd put a stunt show on, and that, that would be the finale of the weekend. And that was really that went really well, except one year, it was a bit of a tragic accident. So we have here a photo of Lace Maxwell, and she was a a, a well liked volunteer who worked with Canteen. And it's pilot the 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 plane is is piloted by uh, Rob Copus, and they took off to to do their stunt part of the weekend, and unfortunately, and tragically, um, the the plane crashed just after takeoff, and and it was a very confusing time. So we have teenagers who some of which are not very well, and we have some volunteer adults that are helping us manage the teenagers. And we're at a remote airfield and it's chaotic. 
and there's people trying to do what they can to try and help. You know, I could talk about this as 20 years ago. I, um, I couldn't talk about it for a while, but we could talk about it now. Um, and so we got people running everywhere, trying to do the you know, bucket brigades and first aiders running in to try and try and help. And it's chaos and it's, a, it's an emotional time and people are confused and trying to do the best they can. Here's the memorial to Lace and Rob. It's at Rob's home airport. He flew down from Brisbane that day um, to, to, do, to volunteer for this weekend and tragically it ended it terribly. Um, you know, we, the, there was a lot of witness, witness statements taken that day and, and you know, um, given the emotional state of a day, um, the nature of teenagers who, you know, with the best of intentions, want to share information about what they thought they saw. But given the emotional situation, there were some errors in that recollection. Um, but, you know, these people are not acting maliciously. They're acting in a way. They're trying to share a story. They're trying to share an emotional point in their life and they're trying to use that information to help others get through with something which is terrible. And so what we have is we have a process uh, which is at the time was run by the, the government department was called the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation Australia. And each of the reports start with what you see on the screen. Essentially, what this is trying to say is that the point of this, the sole purpose is to enhance transport safety. That's the sole purpose of this process. So you should only use these reports for, the, for, for, for matters of safety significance. So, the, you know, the report was, um, it was, it was good reading. It was, it was good because, you know, a lot of the things that, that we thought happened on the day, the investigators went through step by step, forensically step by step, and, and, and addressed each of these uh, recollections and said, this one was true, this one wasn't true. And, and it was good from that point of view, from the witness's point of view. And the other thing, as tragic as the situation was, um, there were some findings that came out of it that said, if you want to do a show like this in the future, this is our recommendations to everyone. And that was shared to the world. And I think that's a great outcome of a, of, of a really terribly tragic situation, that we have this learning. Uh, so, so as senseless and as tragic as this was, you know, this, you know, this, this knowledge can contribute to the safety of everyone else. And I, I guess, you know, that's a, that's a very personal story of mine. So I've just shared that, but where does this go with cyber? Um, this goes to the fact that, you know, the proposal that we have is this cyber incident review board is something that we can do to sort of try and learn from really tough situations when people are under the most pressure they might be under for their whole career, where their recollection might not be as sharp as it could be, where people are trying to work under the best of intentions to get things done and it might not come out the way they hope. But what we want to try and do is learn from that. So the two areas that we see driving these changes of expectations is, of course, uh, on the on the on the legal side, and 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 the one of the key motivations of that is if we look at class actions for for breaches in Australia, and what we can see is before the start of 2023, there was only ever one class action, and that settled for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, a pretty small amount of money. But after 2023 starts, we see four actions that are currently working their way through the system, Optus and Medibank 2 each, I think. Um, so we see this happening on the legal side. And we're also seeing, you know, uh, organisations demanding more rigour, demanding more um, explanation for cyber breaches. They want to be able to explain it to their stakeholders. And we sometimes see people hauled into Senate estimates and, 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 and things like this. So, so we are seeing this more, more demand for more rigorous uh, accounting of how we prevented breaches and how we responded to breaches. But the second aspect is this part of this Australian Department of Home Affairs Cyber Shields concept. Now, here's the six cyber shields. 
Now, these, this is a work in progress. This is supposed to be a 10-year work in progress. But the, the shield that we're focusing on for the Cyber Incident Review Board is the first shield, the strong businesses and citizens. And if we go into the strong businesses and citizens sort of proposal from Home Affairs, the things that leap out to me as part of the proposal is that what the board wants to do is it, it should investigate things like understanding vulnerabilities that led to an attack. That's interesting. And it also wants to examine the effectiveness of the industry response to cyber industry incidents. That's also interesting. And the reason those two things are interesting is because they imply that if you have vulnerabilities that you could have reasonably mitigated against, you might end up in a situation where a board like this might make a negative finding against you. You might end up in a situation that did you have reasonably effective uh, industry response to a cyber incident? You might end up in a negative finding. Now, the, the purpose of this board is not to find fault. That's what it says. That's a proposal. But the reality is that once evidence is collected and once an investigation is completed, that information is out there. And we can see the parallels in the air, in the air side of things that sometimes that leads to legal actions after those other processes are finished, the same thing is possible here. So as a, as a, as a business leader, if this board gets up, and it's like, I think it's likely to get up because we see something similar in the US, and, and I think there's a lot of goodwill behind it. If this proposal gets up, I think that you know these are the couple of things you've got to think about. So we've just covered why the Cyber Incident Review Board might impact your, you know, your, the, the way you plan to control your network and defend against vulnerabilities and to, and show you took reasonable steps. But the, the reason that they're similar is because the investigation process used by digital forensics people like me, which is on the screen now, is very similar to the investigation process used by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. So we can make the assumption here that evidence is going to be collected and it's going to be examined similar to what we're already doing in a digital forensics investigation. So I think this is this is the, the implication being that if this board gets up, you need to think about what are the steps you can do to really increase that, that the chances of, of driving down vulnerabilities um, and things like that. And I put them up on the screen. I'm not going to go through them individually. And the reason that these haven't been resolved is because the legislation is still being worked on. And they've called for industry. We've made a submission. A lot of people have made a submission. Um, but there's still a lot of complexities. But I think it's got a good chance of getting up. But so what of it, all this is that cyber breaches are going to be more closely examined in the future, whether it's on the legal side or on the political side. If they don't get examined by either of those bodies, they might be examined by an incident review board. Even if the board is decided that it's not going to find fault, it still is going to gather evidence. It's still going to investigate things. And that might leave you open in the future to a potential separate legal action. So what I want to do is I want to talk about more control and more options in cyber. Because what we want to do here, we can do many things, but an easy solution that we can apply to try and increase our chances of driving down breaches is putting more control on our network. And a couple of concepts along that is prevention of breaches. We can look at single sign-on for infrastructure. So we all know what single sign-on is. It's a great idea. We all use a single place where we can control who can access what systems. And that's, that's great. One of the areas that's a bit of a blind spot for IT people is when they're setting up infrastructure. And we've got it is the solutions you can put in place sort of drive uh, much earlier single sign-on um, setup. Physical security of devices can help. So we can have uh, these things like YubiKeys, they can really help prevent unauthorized signings. And we want to do some reduction of harm for breaches. So if we have a quick way of blocking access to systems, um, that's great. And when we roll out forensics tools, they're pretty invasive. So some of our customers, they're a bit 
uh, they're not really sure because they're looking at our forensic tools. I was going to say, these things can do a lot of things. Uh, what can we do to protect our systems just in case? And so if we have a bit more control, it might help drive more confidence when we're doing a live response. It's interesting you mention YubiKeys, you know, hard keys in relation to cybersecurity. It, the concept of defense in depth is as old or older than you know, NIST protocols and, and, uh, and uh, you know, um, older than many cybersecurity companies today. And it's, it, it never, we never lose the fact that A, covering your endpoints and your network and your cloud and ensuring that you have the right control points covered, but then B, adding layers of protection at those control points, whether it's something you have or something you know, um, it, it never goes away. And, and we famously, Cloudflare famously um, thwarted a, a uh, relatively um, sophisticated phishing attempt through the use of YubiKeys. Um, and uh, the attackers had spoofed our Okta login page, had um, sent incredibly credible looking communications to our employees. And there was absolutely no way that the attack was going to work because at the ver the last step of logging in for all of us is to confirm uh, confirm ownership of a YubiKey in conjunction with the device that's trying to activate it. And the attacker simply wouldn't be able to do that. So interesting you raise it, two really important principles and one that's very much uh, very much close, close to our hearts. So thanks, uh, Matt, and looking forward to the rest of the story. No problem. Um, all right, so let's get into a case. So um, so we're going to look at a, an untargeted cyber incident. So most of the things that happen in the general um in general, are going to be untargeted attacks. They're not going to be sophisticated attacks. Now, when we're looking at this, I want you to think about uh, what is it, what is it we can do to prevent this kind of breach, and what I want you to think about is what we can do to contain and eradicate problems early on. Um, the priorities of an incident handler are, are very straightforward. In the standard, it says that we need to prioritise containment and eradication. And then we need to sort of look at how we can help the organization deliver its key outcome. That's our priorities. Sometimes in an investigation, there is sometimes a little bit of a temptation to move into investigation to find out who's at fault. And we have to resist those things because the most important thing is to stop the spread and stop the damage. And that's why the standard says that's what we have to put first. So if we look at the case background of this particular case, so we have a franchise system. So we're migrating an accounting system that was operating in a back office. So we have one of these closets with servers racked in a closet and, a, and an air conditioning unit. And it's got about 100 independent businesses on the accounting system. And it's being managed in this closet. And, and the old managed service provider who provided the IT to that um, business uh, lost their work to a different managed service provider. And they wanted to migrate this particular uh, service setup into the cloud. It's a Microsoft Azure. And so what they did was they wanted, because they figured, well, we've got this office connection. It's a bit, you know, it might be difficult to move such a big chunk of data. So we're going to move the data first, 2.8 terabytes of data. It was moved up to Azure, ready to go. Uh, and then now we have to configure the server. That's what the uh, managed service provider who won the contract, they had to configure the server so that it could be accessed um, by the new, by, by you know, by, by people. So, so we've got these people coming in and they're sort of saying, all right, um, we need remote desktop service so people could connect into this server and access the accounting system. And so what happened was one of the guys opened up the port remote desktop access and saying, what what harm can one port being open for a few hours cause? Well, what happened was there was a chain of events that happened after that. So the, the winning MSP got really busy and they wanted to get help in configuring the server. So they outsourced it to a different MSP who they've used in the past. And that second MSP got really busy. And then they outsourced it to another MSP. So we have at least three people who have the administrative logging credentials 
for this particular server. One morning, the team comes in and they find that the data has been encrypted. This is the worst thing you can see. So you see a ransom note like this. And the ransom says, look, you've got to, you've got to talk to us. So essentially, we have a, a, a criminal gang and they have their chat line. So when you're ready to negotiate, you click the chat now and you, you chat with them and you try and come to an arrangement. But what's interesting about, and there's always a ticking clock, there's always, there's always this ticking clock of pressure. And what's interesting about these kind of things, this is, this is an interesting uh, ransom note because here it says, decryption of your files with the help of third parties, that's me, may cause increased price because they can add their fee to ours. Or you could become a victim of a scam because apparently I'm going to scam you by helping you, which I think is an interesting position to take. So what did we do? Wow. We did. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. I think uh, back to what we said earlier, Matt, about the worst day of people's lives. I'm sure many people get the chills just looking at a visual like this. If they, you know, and if they've not already received one, you know, this is a good primer on on, on what the um, the evil side of you know of the internet and the people that work on it looks like. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate you sharing this from from your archives. Um, I also think you know it just demonstrates the fact that all of these resources that we feel like we're using for our benefit, whether it's sales tools or cloud workloads to help speed things up or whatever it might be, um, you know, service um, cloud as a service or, or, or CRM as a service, these are all being deployed at to, to great effect by the uh, the uh, criminals who are trying to um, trying to extort and steal. So um, it's a sobering reminder and, and it's, um, it's good of you to share it. So thank you. No problem. Uh, so essentially, our, we've got this problem now. Our problem is this. We need to find out how the login happened. So has one of the three people who have that administrative, or three companies, in fact, who have that administrative login, have they been breached? Or has someone, you know, applied a password guessing system to this device, to this remote desktop server and found a password. And it was pretty easy for us to establish that we pulled down the, the, the dead server, we examined it forensically, and we found that there was hundreds of thousands at least of guesses applied to find the administrative password. So it turns out that if you have something exposed on the internet, even for a few hours, it starts to show up on scanning tools that are looking for open ports. And once those open ports are found, it's autom software automation can then pass it off to a password guesser. And suddenly your system's getting hammered to try and guess the password to get in. So that's how it happened. So we were able to rule out that one of the other systems was breached. So we started to, to put a box around our containment. And the next question was, was any of the other MSP customers affected? Because that's a legitimate question. And... That was actually difficult for us to find out because it wasn't clear, there wasn't clear documentation how the MSP's network was set up. And so, you know, if we had a bit more focus on tunnels or a bit more control over the network, we would have been able to rule things out faster instead of sort of chasing these leads down because we need to get to that containment. That's our highest priority. We can't declare it until we've, we've closed off all of these leads. So because... It was a bit, uh, you know, we, we didn't have this clean network set up. We had to sort of chase those rabbit holes and find out if there's wider um, um, contamination, which we were able to rule out. So what we found was that we had someone applied a password guessing to a few hours after the, uh, the port was opened up. But data was copied out and then it was given the appearance of encryption. This is an increasing trend where they're not encrypting all the files because that takes too long. What they're really wanting to do is give the appearance that some files are encrypted or not even any files. Like I've heard of cases where the main extortion is the threat to leak the information publicly. So that's kind of what they're trying to apply here. So the outcome was that we achieved, um, we achieved containment fairly rapidly, but um, 24 hours is a long time, especially when you're going flat chat. Um, we, if we had more control over the network, we might have been able to get that containment much faster. And if we had an ability to sort of uh, set up some sort of single sign-on system or at least shield 
these servers for the internet, we could have ruled out a lot more of our investigation and gotten to containment faster. So I want to run, more, run through one more case because it's not just about systems. There's always this interaction between people and systems that, that sometimes can make a, a case difficult to reach that containment faster. So if I go into the second case, we've got this wholesaler and the wholesaler is very well run. It's got a very tight cybersecurity approach. You know, it's following the, uh, the, the NIST CSF framework, which is a popular cybersecurity framework. Now, what's happened was there's a bit of background to this case. Six months before a particular breach happened, we see one of the people in the accounts group was spearfished. And that person was convinced by a very convincing con person um, but they should get a copy of a particular sensitive file. And then the accounts person shared that file to the unauthorized person. And it was detected to the, to the company's credit. And, you know, they were able to look at it and go, okay, the damage here was very limited. And, you know, we're going to treat this like a learning experience. We're going to treat, we're going to try and say, look, you know, this is, we've got a limited damage. We can, we can approach it through a training and counseling approach. And I, and I think that's a great approach. I think that's very, it shows a lot of empathy. I think that's great. Now, um, for, for the present day, we've got an external third party who rings in and tries to pretend they're from a Australian bank. Now this party who rang in, rang in knew about four unusual, unusual amounts and unusual timing one-off payments made by this wholesaler the day before and because they knew that contributed to the credibility of the person who was ringing in so we got this con person ringing in and they're trying to convince our accounts person that the legitimacy from the bank and they mentioned these four payments and this that, that at least that's what we were told in our first witness interview Three days later, this is what tipped off the, the, the wholesaler to the problem. They get customers ring in. So three customers ring in. So there's 100 payments made on a Friday. And of those 100, three customers ring in. And they say that someone rang them to try and convince them that payments were made in error. And they should pay it back to a particular bank account so it could be reprocessed. And they quickly determined that that was attempted to all 100 people who received the payments. So at that point, they took the sensible action and everything was frozen financially. They froze everything, which for an organization like this is very tricky because they're, they're dealing with many partners. So freezing things is actually a really big step, but it was the only step they could have done. So the question that arises is, how did the con person know about these four payments? to convince this, um, to convince this uh, clerk. And that's kind of when we get called in. So the MSPs looked at it and the MSP said, look, we're not really sure. So they handed off to their managed um, security service provider who hands it off to us. And this is the ultimate question because the answer to that question will tell us if the bad people are in the network. Have they got persistent access to the accounting department's computers? Do they have persistent access to the bank accounts? You know, is there some is there an ongoing breach that the organization's not aware of? So we come in and interview people, and then we quickly, you know, this is the story that we've paint we've been painted. And we've quickly pieced it all together. It's taken us a few days actually, because we had to scan a few hundred computers, I think, because we were looking for signs that a computer had been infected and it's gotten past their normal virus scanners. Virus scanners are only about 50% effective sometimes. So we're looking through these computers, looking for forensic signs of, of infection, and we're coming up blank. And we're trying to figure it out. Eventually, we paste the entire sequence of events together. So the sequence of events was this. We have someone who has... Um, you know, the, the counselling that they received a few months earlier has led them to feel a bit embarrassed. So when the breach happened, they actually provided misleading information. So what happened in reality was, and this is why it's important to sort of approach these things of empathy, because you need them to trust you so you can get to the bottom of it quickly. So the reason what happened was, the reason they knew about the four payments was because for this particular bank, the logins 
the, the start of a login was the same, for example, six digits, and the back of a login was a unique six digits. And the con person's rung through, and they've said, look, don't tell me the first six digits. Just tell me the last six digits of a login. And then so I could uh, just to verify who you are, and then I can talk to you about your account. And then so the accounts close has read the last six digits, which is the only digits that matter in this particular thing. But she's like, how do I know you're from the bank? And then the con person says, I'm going to send you an email from the bank to prove that to you that I'm from the bank. And what they do is in this case, they go to the bank and they initiate a password reset. So an email comes in from the bank. Now, the account the accounts person is actually their English is not the super best. So they look at that and they say, okay, that's a that's from the bank. And then they they will, you know, then it was off to the races. Then, you know, the trust has been established. Um, they provided the the one one time code to get into the account, and then the the bad people quickly downloaded all of the payments from the account. So they weren't actually able to make payments because this particular organisation was clever. They made it so two people had to authorise each payment, but the information was used to try and con the people who received the payments, which is a very sophisticated con. So what what can we learn from this particular case? Well, we spent a lot of time scanning a lot of computers and a lot of servers that were directly exposed to the internet. If we had more network control over them, we would have been able to save all of that time and we probably would have gotten to containment faster because we would have realized there's something amiss about the story. But because we had to treat it, we, 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 we had to go in thinking we've got to scan everything, you know, we, we, it took us a bit longer to get there. We got there after about, I think it was two days, but it was two days of disruption and stress for that organization. I imagine, Matt, also a lot of stress for the uh, individual who was, in, who was involved and who, who picked up the phone and who was eventually scammed. And I think when you hear the level of detail, you've got to search. Everyone has to search inside themselves and be very, very confident they wouldn't fall for what is incredibly sophisticated, both from a technical and from a psychological perspective. No amount of security training, which is the usual um, answer in these cases, no amount of security training is going to prepare you for a scammer that's able to generate an email that looks pretty good immediately to give you some digits that look very good immediately and to prey on some of the you know the, the things that you've learned in in previous cybersecurity trainings there's very if there was going to be a case that showed us that the hu human beings cannot be the weakest link that we have to build systems and processes whereby people can click on the links and open the emails and do the work that they have to do from a digital perspective that's one of those stories so um it took you a couple of days but well done on persevering um, these are the amazing stories, Matt. Tell us, take us home. What what are we gonna? What are you gonna learn? What are your recommendations? What's the uh, what what is your what the outcome we're gonna leave our uh, listeners with today? So the walkaways I want you to think about from today is consider society's increased expectations. Even if the Cyber Incident Review Board doesn't go ahead, which I think is unlikely, but even if it doesn't go ahead, we have higher expectations. You know, people uh, they they're looking at. Uh, what reasonable steps have you done to prevent or to mitigate a breach? And then the second thing is you can do many things to prevent that, but one of the things you could try is exerting more control over your network. And that that increases your defense in depth against breaches, but it also, and this is something that you might want to consider, is during a breach, it gives people like me more control to be able to lock things down faster and, and contain things more. And look, you know, I, I don't have to. I don't have to do this from, from what Cloudflare said, but I do think you should give the Cloudflare Zero Trust uh, product a bit of a, a bit of a go. It's free. You could put it into your lab, get a feel for how it works, find its edges, find out what it can and can't do, and that might be an option that you could look at to give yourself a bit more control.
Great discussion, Matt and Ben, and some fascinating examples there of, of breaches, how they happened and how they could have been contained faster. And look, the analogy Matt made about air safety investigations and cybersecurity was really impactful and really appreciate you, you giving that example there, Matt. Look, we have to talk about AI and Gen AI. There isn't a day that goes by where it's not mentioned. And of course, it is something that CISOs have a lot of concerns about. So keen to hear from you, Matt, your thoughts on the emergence of AI-enabled threats. Um, thanks for the question. Look, I think that um, when we sit in places like Australia and New Zealand, we sit in incredibly privileged countries. And the view that we have is very different to the rest of the world. The view that we have is that we have very, we have a labour shortage. You know, we're always desperate for people. But if we move beyond Australia and New Zealand, we see that that's not a thing. We see we have, you know, unlimited people, unlimited people in our adversaries. You know, if you're looking, if you're running an average cyber criminal gang, when you're hiring, you don't care about what university someone went to. You don't care about, you know, what their background is or what hobbies they have on the weekend. You just care that they can deliver. And so, um, you know, AI is a force multiplier when we have a labour shortage, but it has lesser of an effect when we're thinking about how cyber criminals already operate. Sure, it will automate some of their tasks, 100%. And sure, it might make the phishing emails a bit more how do you say, easy, harder to detect because the English is going to be a bit more on point. Um, but I don't know, but it's going to have the effect because our adversaries, they're not labour constrained. We're labour constrained, they're not. AI as a, as a topic is fascinating for security experts and for Cloudflare is no exception. Uh, it creates incredible opportunity for us to deliver security outcomes much faster, whether it's taking data that we learn across the different control points and pushing them out universally, such that something we learn from protecting against DDoS attacks can inform us against domains and URLs that are, uh, are potentially part of the malicious side of the internet that we can then block activity from on our web security. AI is incredibly powerful and for many years has been something that we've used. Obviously, what it does for our customers and for the world at large, though, is create, a, as Matt says, the it gives the those working on the, the bad side of the internet um, a leg up because it gives them an incredible advantage in their ability to code and produce malware that then can be deployed. And secondly, of course, for, 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 the, for the employees and our customers who are using Gen AI tools, who are cutting and pasting content into these, these tools, it creates another threat vector and it creates another... Um, uh, it, it, it raises the risk profile of those organizations. So as with many things in our space, a threat and an opportunity, but something we're doing our best to harness to offer the best protections that we can. I think that Ben's absolutely right. I think that the the opportunities on the defense side is 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 great. I think it's, it's amazing. There is obviously offensive opportunities, but uh, you know, I think it's great on the defensive side too. Well, that's a great place to leave it. It certainly is an area that we're going to be paying a lot more attention to over the next 12 months. Matt O'Kane from Notion Digital Forensics and Ben Munro from Cloudflare, thank you so much for joining us on this CSO webcast today. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy.